Greetings, Zero and Repeater Books readers. Today, we're joined by Richard gilman Apalski, author of the 2016 repeater book, Spectres of Revolt, on the intellect of insurrection and philosophy from below. This is a fantastic book about insurrection and desire, using theorists as diverse as Julia Kristeva, Felix Gattari, and Raya Dunayevskaya, and has played a major role in my own political development. Joining us is also Kyle from Profane Illuminations, another show associated with Zero and Repeater Books, which you all should definitely check out as well. Richard and Kyle, thank you both very much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, to start us off with, uh, I was wondering if you would mind introducing yourself and what you see as some of the key themes of Spectres of Revolt. Yeah, so... Um, my name is Richard Gilman Opalski, and I'm a philosopher and author, um, an activist, um, and I'm interested in politics from below. I'm interested in thinking through the impasses of revolutionary politics in the 21st century. Um, I'm interested in uh, global uprisings. I'm interested in uh, theories uh, of capitalism uh, from all kinds of different uh, trajectories. And, and Spectres of Revolt was a book that, um, for me, was really trying to think through uh, a period of revitalized global uprisings was trying to think about the relationship between uh, a new wave of global revolts um, and how they inter interact with um, the impasses facing revolutionary politics today. You know, to what extent can we think about revolts in relation to revolutionary politics? To what extent can we think about revolts in, rela in relationship to histories of revolt. Um, you know, how do we understand what a revolt is, what it does, and how it might possibly participate in the radical transformation of the world? So, you know, I mean, it's quite a lot. Um, and, you know, the book is really in some ways just an effort. Um, it's a contribution to trying to grapple with those, with those themes. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there's one line in particular from this book, which I keep returning to, even though I read it, I think about three years ago, uh, you write, can we not finally say that every good Marxist is more than a bit of an anarchist these days? Uh, as I interpreted this remark at the time, I thought it meant that any communism deserving of the name today is indistinguishable from anarchism in both of their orientations away from the state and repressive violence. Uh, but rereading this chapter, I see that there's something much more interesting going on than I initially realized, that there's this kind of bi-directional critique of both status forms of communism and idealist forms of anarchism, including your main targets, uh, individualist anarchism and primitivist anarchism. And I was wondering uh, whether you would accept the inverted formulation of your suggestion, something like every good anarchist is more than a bit of a Marxist these days. Uh, how you would deal with the striking history of antagonism between Marxists and anarchists, not only the famous case of the repression of Machnavism by the USSR, uh, but also the purging of the anarchists during Lenin's reign and, of course, in Ho Chi Minh's Vietnam. Uh, and, and I'm also aware that uh, uh, communization theory, as you use it, has some important place here uh, in this rapprochement between Marxism and anarchism that I'd also be really interested in hearing about. So that's a bit of a barrage of questions. No, that's, that's great. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate them all. Um, yeah, well, I think, first of all, that it's always been true that every good anarchist has been at least a bit of a Marxist. It, probably the best anarchists borrowed more from Marxists, uh, Marx, Marxist analysis. Um, and and there is, of course, a very long history of uh, 
fierce opposition, ideological debate, um, and somewhat surprising from today's perspective, hostility between um, in, uh, you know, uh, anarchists and Marxists of different kinds. Um, I think that the opposition between anarchists and Marxists can be explained historically. It can be understood historically. I mean, if you think about the second half of the 19th century, um, when it seemed to people um, in revolutionary struggles around the world that uh, revolution was imminent, it wasn't a question of if, it was a question of when and how. And when uh, you had uh, incredible examples, like in 1871 with the Paris Commune, of people overtaking cities um, who were engaged in talking and thinking about uh, anarchism and communism and socialism. They were engaged in thinking about the state right, and how to win and how to fight and how to change the world and, and to abolish the existing reality. It seemed in those days, as far as I can tell from you know, my own research, um, looking at the debates, deep into the debates, I mean, if, whether you're talking about debates between uh, somebody like Rosa Luxemburg and, and Edward Bernstein, or whether you're talking about disagreements between Bakunin and Marx, or Proudhon and Marx, um, and many others, of course, um, it seemed that how things would go um, depended very much on what view one took or what position one took or what analysis one one made about the conflicts and crises of the time that we were either going to be crushed or we were going to win and that revolution was going to happen and whether or not it ended up in massacre or emancipation uh, hung in the balance and much of it hung upon uh, how one felt about things like the state, about political violence, how th how one felt about things like um, uh, uh, um, armed revolution, uh, and how one thought about power. Now, the, the problem is today, when we look back on that history of ideological and political rivalry, it appears in the rearview mirror as something that ought to be buried in a graveyard. Um, it's an important part of the histories of anarchism and Marxism. It's an important part of the histories of various social and political struggles around the world. These different debates and arguments that were taking place, whether we're talking about the late 19th century or whether we're talking about 1936 in Spain, they're there and they run into the 20th century, of course, and even to the present, you have um, fiercely hostile anti-Marxist uh, anarchists, and you have um, fiercely hostile um, anti-anarchist Marxists, you know, people um, like, um, uh, who, who, who don't even sometimes realize the proximity of their own thinking to the ones they are, the ones they are, they're uh, opposing in the debate. Um, so, you know, like uh, famously in, in um, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri's Empire, it, they took great pains to say, we are not anarchists because we focus on production. And one would almost have to say, well, then have you ever read Kropotkin? I mean, anarchists like Malatesta um, and Kropotkin, um, they don't ignore, produ uh, they don't r r ignore the relations of production. They focus on it. In, in many ways, in a very, coming out of reading Marx themselves. I mean, Malatesta read Marx and Kropotkin read Marx and they debated with them. And, and, so, and, and so, and then you have anarchists um, who are hostile uh, to Marx, as if you would think that the anarchists sometimes uh, have the same view of Marxism and communism as right-wing pseudo-libertarians here in the United States, that they're all statists, that they're all, uh, that they're, that they all want to see long lines for rations uh, or something like that, that they want to see some kind of a totalitarian top-down form of government. So I think, uh, in, in my view, um, 
what we have to do finally is we have to recognize some of the prescient insights um, that have been vindicated by history of the anarchists, right? So when anarchists um, would say that, uh, like Bakunin says in Statism and Anarchy, that uh, by a seemingly invariable social law, power invariably corrupts. Uh, it seemed like pure ideology in the late 19th century. But with some of the examples that you mentioned about the purges, you talk about Ho Chi Minh in the, in the Soviet Union, it would seem to serve as a historical vindication of some of the anarchist fears about the invariable corruptibility of power. I think we have to confess that. And I think we have to retrieve um, ways of thinking about communism that are that that tr understand communism more as a process, more as a form of life, sort of a more ontological approach to what is communism or what does it mean, um, and more as a process, like Marx himself insisted that it was in the German ideology. Um, so when you ask about communization, you know that is one of many uh, trajectories coming out of Marxist theory that, um, that, that, that says we have to think about the immediate creation of communist social relations. We don't want to wait until we have some kind of a, you know, institutional achievement at the level of formal politics. We have to drop that. It's, it's got a record, there's a documentary record, and it's not one that we simply should be proud of or be apologetic about, as somebody like Alan Badiou comes very close to being when he thinks about the, the so-called communist projects of the 20th century. So my view is that we have to uh, appreciate the importance of the debate between anarchists and communists, but we have to bury them in a graveyard for orthodoxies. We are not in a very good position right now if we're interested in revolution, if we're interested in radically changing the world. We, 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 we should not uh, 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 oppose ourselves to other anti-capitalist revolutionaries. Um, we have to, um, we, can't, we can't afford to do that. It's not, uh, you know, 1868, where the question is, you know, whose ideas will decide the course of the revolution. And that's a part of what's going on in Spectres of Revolt. Because, you know, what, when we look around in our world today, we don't actually see the kinds of classical revolutionary politics that Marx hoped for and Burke Edmund Burke worried about. We see revolts, you know, we see revolts. And it, in some ways, it's, it's a much more preliminary stage of something we might think of as revolution or revolutionary. You know, in some ways, it's, it's at a much more preliminary stage, even if we could call it that, because much of what we see in the revolts um, probably can't even be considered revolutionary in a preliminary way. And so because that's our starting position, because that's the present reality of the world in which we live, because those are the conditions of the struggle that we see, um, what we need to do is we need to pull the insights, particularly about power and the state, out of uh, some of the uh, greater anarchist um, sources. And we need to go back to Marx and stay with Marx. Marx, to me, is more important. He, he was, uh, I mean, some of the best anarchists, um, what they were doing was they were assimilating um, Marx's uh, body of work into their own thought. Um, and then they were, um, they were disagreeing on, on, on specific questions from there. Um, and I think those disagreements are extremely important. Uh, but Marx gave his entire life from the age of 26 until his death um, to answering the question, what is capital? You know, what is it? How does it work? What does it do? How does it organize our lives? You know, and, and, and to this day, there is no one who has given over an entire life to that question with the same depth um, and intensity that Marx has done. And I think that today we still need those as our central questions. What is capital today? What is it doing? How is it organizing our lives right now? You know, and of course, um, so Marx, I think, is uh, extremely important, but we also 
can't be afraid to um, uh, be called uh, as Lenin would have, because it's not just communization theory. There were left communists um, who were critical of the Soviet Union very early on. You had people like Sylvia Pankhurst, of course, and Hermann Gorder. And these left communists that criticized Lenin, Lenin called them uh, infantile. Right. He, he wrote that uh, brilliant, um, that brilliant essay, uh, left wing communism and infantile disorder. Uh, but uh, but I think that today the infantile disorder that was diagnosed by Lenin is actually um, it, 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 it doesn't appear that way anymore. It appeared that way to him. But, he, but, but it doesn't apply. We need left-wing communism. We need communization. We need um, anarchist-inflected forms of Marxism. We need a deep critique of power in the state. We need a multifarious approach to the questions, not just of what capital is and does, but to the question of what revolution will look like. Mm -hmm. And for, that, for, that, for those purposes, why should we keep any resources on the shelf? Is last time I checked, we were losing. We're not winning, so we have to pull the resources all out that we can use um, to develop the kinds of tools that we need, both analytical and political. I think this perf that perfectly demonstrates that perfectly leads us into, I think the probably the, the one one of the 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 a uh, very there's two pedals in the central locus of the of this book that I've been able to discern. And one of them, they're both directly in the title, but in particular, I want to emphasize um, with this question, the idea of spectrality haunting and everything as you were just talking about the unfinished business of history, history as this sort of Im as this imposition when placed and recognized as the art of human hands, as Marxism and uh, histor hi historiography after Marxism so artfully um, demonstrates in various disagreeing, but I think it's still you know relevant ways. You quite artfully in the introduction of this book engage with the narrative around one of my favorite subjects in history, the Thracian slave, yeah. Spartacus. Um, sp and I think as a useful example of the hauntological um, and its role in analyzing the revolt. Um, What's always been so exciting about Spartacus and his story is his unruly presence. Uh, the annals of history all of a sudden have to deal with this Thracian slave. Yeah. Um, so he gets buried historically um, until all of a sudden a specter is haunting Europe. Um, and as for Marx, who was one of – if basically the, the chief architect in the popular rise of Spartacus in popular consciousness, something that we still experience with – the Stanley Kubrick film, Dal Dalton Trumbo written film, Breaking the Back Blacklist in the 20th century, to their to their the terrible Showtime series <laughs> uh, that I have too many opinions about. Um, but for Marx, Spartacus was one of those specters we need to give rise that gives rise to this usefully confrontation the, the useful confrontation of the implicit and perhaps endemic violence of the social world via the own conditions of the social world a slave is confronting the system of slavery Toussaint Louvatore is teaching the French how to be French and I have a quote from you here despite great limitations and much disagreement in our knowledge of Spartacus and the surrounding history it is difficult to see the events otherwise undoubtedly the conditions of enslavement gave incentive to the revolt of the slaves very well put um, and I guess I'm just interested first simply how you came to consider the hauntological aspect of this unfinished business of revolt as you were touching on just earlier, um, but also how perhaps since writing this work, you've come to see the significance of these continued confrontation with society that is trying to excise, to purge its ghosts in order to maintain its own defensive posture, its state of, to get a little Foucaultian, its state of readiness in the war to defend itself. So, you know, how, how are the ghosts doing, I guess, is the second half of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, thank you so much for that, Kyle. That's, that's great. Um, well, first, let me just say that um, if you have an interest in Spartacus, 
you uh, might appreciate there's a whole section uh, in my book, The Communism of Love, that is dedicated to thinking about Spartacus in a different way, in a different light. Um, so, so yeah, let me um, try to get at some of what you what you said there, Kyle. Um, well, there are two things going on at the outset of Specters of Revolt. Um, there are two sort of larger framing. Uh, there are two two framing themes, if you will, at the beginning of Spectres of Revolt. And the first one is obviously what you mentioned about the specter haunting Europe, the 1848 specter of Marx and Engels, when they, with, with a great sort of sense of palpable excitement, think about the specter of communism. And it always struck me as such a beautiful um, idea of a ghost, the ghost that you're happy to have around, the ghost that gives you hope you know, and that for uh, Marx and Engels to say that a specter is haunting Europe and it's the specter of communism, they are not uh, thinking about the ghost as if it was some kind of a uh, frightful villain in a film from the 1980s. They're thinking about the ghost as a hopeful haunting, as a happy haunting. And they're also thinking about the fear of Mitterrand and they're thinking about the fear of the ruling class as very good news. You want the ruling class to be afraid. And, and Marx and Engels open with this sort of celebration of a happy haunting of a good ghost. Now the other thing, that's, so that's one thing, is a question of uh, spectrality in which the ghost is something we need um, because it's indicative of the fear of the ruling class and it's also indicative of the of the possibility, if not the likelihood, of the of what of what will rise up against them, and that is clearly connected also with the case of Spartacus. Because if one looks, and we have not many resources, there was of course Appian and Plutarch, but Aldo Schiavone wrote a beautiful book. Uh, Schiavone wrote a beautiful book called Spartacus, where he really. Um, it helped us understand what was going on in the ludus, you know, which I mentioned in Spectres of Revolt. But if you look at the ludus, um, and it, it, what you see there is that the the uh, the Lannister and the whole system of the uh, gladiatorial captivity was afraid of the revolt. I mean, the whole the whole uh, infrastructure of the of the tunnels, the whole infrastructure of the captivity, the physical and material structures of that system were an announce where they were an announcement that the system was haunted by the specter of revolt. I mean, every caution was taken to prevent uh, Spartacus from rising up even before they knew that he might. You see, and I think that's a, a very crucial thing in the case of Spartacus, and obviously Kyle it connects too with Foucault, because when Foucault wrote *Discipline and Punish*, and then when he uh, reflected on that in the interviews in the 1970s in *Power and Knowledge*, um, this was also about uh, how uh, you can get the captivity, the ca the, the captives as he calls them in, uh, in power knowledge, as Foucault calls them, the, the little captive silhouettes in the panoptic prison, how they can interiorize the gaze of the overseer. You know, this is what the anarchists call the cop in your head. And how they interiorize the gaze of the overseer. But what's the point of the interiorization of the gaze? It's because uh, those who hold the prisoners captive worry about revolt. And so they want you to think that you could always be, you're always under surveillance, right? They want you to think that at any moment you can be watched and put down. So it's a sophistication that uh, Foucault studied. Um, obviously, a lot of development in those systems of control that worry about revolt and the specter of revolt going, you know, from the time of Spartacus to the time of the present. The other major theme at the outset of Spectres of Revolt is the book by Jacques Derrida, uh, Spectres of Marx. Um, you know, Spectres of Marx was, was published uh, shortly after the end of the Cold War. And uh, I was a student of Derrida's um, at the New School for Social Research in Manhattan. And I remember that many of us were waiting 
for Derrida to write about Marx. And obviously, we know that it was a huge event when Derrida published his book on Marx because, um, you know, you could read ghostly demarcations and you could read the whole sort of symposium of Marxists, you know, uh, variously happy and mad that, about what Derrida said about Marx in that book. But Derrida's idea to, to talk about the specters of Marx, the specter of Marx after the end of the Cold War, was for was was for people like me was for marxists like me uh, it was wonderful because a lot of people in the social sciences and humanities and in, in politics outside in the world um, in everyday conversation were happy finally to declare the death of marx you know 1989 to 1991 it's been tried it's been done what eric hobsbawm called the short 20th century 1914 to you know 1991 and um and now it's over we can place a tombstone finally a, yet another tombstone perhaps we should say uh um on top of karl marx and derrida says well no it's not possible, really. This world is going to continue to be haunted by the specter of Marx. Um, and so now you're thinking about, and of course, why would Marx go away when capitalism hasn't? I mean, and even if Marx is dead, um, his specter still haunts. And of course, since Derrida wrote that book and since Derrida's death, um, we have seen that people are still afraid of Marx. Right. And a specter still haunts the world. It's not just... Uh, Europe. It's the world in many ways. In the United States, there was a full-blown organized effort by the last White House to attack socialism, and the threat of communism is now on the lips of po capitalist politicians as if it were 1969. It's a remarkable uh, comeback of the old Cold War attacks on the dangers of Marx and socialism and so forth. So the world is still haunted. But now when I zoomed out from the specter of communism haunting Europe, and when I was thinking about the specter of Marx haunting the world, it seemed to me that there was a missing, a missing figure and it was the specter of revolt because in the revolts that I was seeing when I was working on this book, you know, they were not all clearly Marx and Marxist. One can't simply say that uh, Occupy Wall Street or the uprising in uh, the uh, Middle Eastern and North African countries called the Arab Spring or the uprising in Greece in 2008 and 2009. Right. Uh, one cannot simply say this is the specter of Marx. Um, and one cannot say that uh, without some kind of... Um, without a kind of disingenuous ideological position. And there were many of those, you know, that all of these revolts are about capitalism. It's not true, it wasn't true. And it isn't true that the George Floyd rebellion is all about capitalism. We have to be honest. We won't do ourselves any favors by making um, brazen ideological interpretations of the content of every revolt, as if all of the content is about, you know, revolution against capitalism or something like that. It simply isn't true. Um, so, uh, so, so what I saw there, uh, in, in the book was that, um, it, it really is the revolt that haunts. It's not necessarily communism. Um, to some extent that is true. It's not necessarily Marx. You know, Derrida and Marx are not totally wrong, but also we have to account for what is this much more heterogeneous, unruly, and diverse phenomena, which is ultimately irrepressible, called revolt, right? That also haunts, um, and it haunts almost in a kind of, uh, in, in a Spartac, in, in, the, in a kind of a way of Spartacus, doesn't it? Because yeah. what we know about, I mean, it is true that in the parlor game of Karl Marx, he refers to uh, Spartacus, not only as his favorite hero, but as the representative of the ancient proletariat, right? And it's a beautiful, hopeful thought. 
<laughs> but really, I mean, to, to imagine Spartacus as a kind of a, an ancient figure of, of, of the working class that would emerge much later on in Manchester capitalism, it's, 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 it's a little too much, isn't it? What it's Spartacus, a imagination. It's, it's a great, it's a revolutionary yeah. imagination. It's wonderful. But what Spartacus was opposed to were the existing conditions. Mm -hmm. right? The conditions of the ludus, the conditions of captivity. What the third servile revolt was about was it was a, it was about opposing, and and standing up against the established power, right? And um, and the revolt is much more like that. It's it's a reaction against. Uh, different forms of captivity. They're not like the ones in the Ludus, but captivities of capitalism in a city like Baltimore, you know, um, or in a city like Ferguson, which is very close to where I sit today. Um, so, yeah, the specter of revolt. I want us to think about that almost in a kind of series, specter of communism, specter of Marx, specter of revolt, and maybe not necessarily in that order. Well, Kyle, I've actually just realized I asked two questions and I, I jumped over our order a little bit. <laughs> so would you like to ask another? Sure. Yeah. We, you don't even have to worry about it. <laughs> it. It actually leads into the next one, I think, really well. Uh, I want to I want to take a sort of a glance at the third chapter of Spectres of Revolt, which specifically outlines um, a, the idea of culture jamming um, and places it in conversation with a, a an al like almost a, a theoretical body of theoretical and political explorations of refusal, reversal, antagonism, insurgency, and all of this in contrast to, I think, a, a very important contemporary phenomenon to the, the primacy of this knowledge of politics as a defining horizon for political action that I'm sure we are even more intimately familiar with in the six years since this book has been published. Uh, I know that I am this idea, this, this absent in my own work, I talk about, I work to define the idea of a passive bearing witness as divorced from something that you've talked about before, radical love. Um, and I think this is exactly the kind, the, the kind of idea, this, this idea, the, the observation as the prime motive in ruling episteme uh, of sort of like political consciousness. I guess simply, I just want to ask, what exactly is culture jamming? Um, the idea of unjamming, its relationship to these this postmodern politics that you've described, and its role as an insurrectionary logic. Um, I, I particular, I think people would particularly be interested in your work with the board. Um, and how you've engaged with him and sort of like, like asserted a, 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 a stronger, I don't know the word, a, a, a placing emphasis on the board in an interesting and unique way. I'll let you, you describe it. I really appreciate that, uh, those thoughts. Um, and um, uh, first, let me uh, just uh, say that uh, I've just finished a new manuscript, which is forth uh, will be a, is a will be forthcoming um, on AK Press in late 2023, early 2024. The title of which is "Imaginary Power: Real Horizons," um, and the subtitle I think is "Dreaming Our Enemies' Nightmares." Um, but you know, um, I I haven't let go of chapter three. <laughs> Of specters of revolt, um, so I'm thinking a lot about um, imaginary power. I'm thinking a lot about some of the cultural aspects of um, of the opposition to capitalism, right? Um, and the relationship between uh, confronting uh, what's going on um, at the level of ideology, the relationship between doing that. And, change, and, and, and dealing with the material conditions of the world such as it is. So, I mean, one of the nice things about Guy Debord, I mean, there's quite a lot there. I've, I've got a book on Debord called um, Spectacular Capitalism. But uh, is there's a chapter in the Society of the Spectacle called Ideology Materialized. Right? And one of the things that Debord is doing in, ideology, in that chapter on Ideology Materialized is he's resisting... Mm -hmm. 
that hard separation between uh, ideology on the one hand and the material conditions of the world on the other. So, I mean, one of the great advances of Debord and the Situationists was the understanding that the material conditions of the world such as they are, social conditions, social relations in one specific place or another, are made possible, held in, in, in place, made possible, held in place, reproduced by ideology, right? So ideology isn't something that just happens, um, you know, at, at, at some abstract level of philosophy. Ideology is something that has a direct relationship to the world. It comes out of the world, as Marx said, right? It's a reflection of the world and our experiences in the world, as Marx said. But it's not only going in that direction. I mean, Gramsci was already hip to that advance beyond Marx, much before Gramsci and Lukács, much before de Borde was. But what I like about de Borde, and this gets to your question about culture jamming, is that de Borde was one of the last stops in post-war French, what we could call maybe post-war French critical theory, before a kind of tendency to abandon uh, revolutionary politics, you know. Uh, and why I say the abandonment of revolutionary politics, that's a bit controversial, I understand. But what I mean is, if you look at the trajectory of postmodern theory after de Borde, you know, uh, it, a lot of it finds politics increasingly dissuasive. Okay, I mean the obvious example of that is uh, somebody like Jean Baudrillard in the nineteen late seventies and the nineteen eighties, um, but it, but he's not alone. There was all that disaffection about what happened at the end of the struggle for Algerian independence. It didn't result in some kind of a communization or some major advance um, for 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 communists. More de Gaulleism. Uh, the, exactly right. More de Gaullism. And of course, that was the context of May, June 68 in Paris. So I think you're right. Um, now, what, 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 when we say that de Borde was a political thinker, that he was thinking about ideology materialized, right, that they're not these separate spheres, but material conditions and ideology have a kind of um, reciprocity between them. Um, and, he, and when we say that, it, it, as well as when we acknowledge that he was political, he wasn't going to, you know, Baudrillard's last chapter of, on nihilism. He wanted to try to think about how to push through the impasses, almost in a similar way as I've always wanted to do in my work. Um, I was inspired by de Borde. I mean, I find his work extremely important um, for for not just my own work, but for thinking about politics in the present. But he used, um, uh, in 1956, de Borde wrote an essay called Report on the Construction of Situations, in which he started to introduce this idea of détournement. And détournement, what, it's almost what it sounds like in English, something like detouring or detouring or hijacking or derailing. And culture jamming, finally now, Kyle, I mean, it's going on a little bit long probably, but... Um, um, we'll wind up now. Nah, we yeah. love <laughs> I mean, this is what I want. <laughs> but um, culture jamming, you know, is, is just one very uh, contemporary example of detournement, right, is that you you see that the landscape of the existing society is controlled and it projects and presents a certain ideological view of that society. So detournement is about taking what we can't afford to buy our own billboards, so it's about taking the billboards that are out there in the landscape of our own existing societies and making them say something else, making them speak against what they were they were purchased to say making it so it's a it's a politics of subversion that's one aspect of the tournament it's a politics of subversion but it's also a politics that wants to intervene um in an imaginary space right it wants to 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 um to uh interrupt certain ways of thinking and to introduce different ways of thinking 
it's really desperate. I mean, one of the things about the tournament and the situationists is it, it, in some ways it represents an incredibly desperate opportunism. It's like, you know, what can we do? Climb up the scaffolding. Who can do it? Four people at night. I mean, it's very far away from storming the Bastille. Or, you know, it's, it's so desperate and opportunistic and it's not even close to what we ultimately need. But the insight in it which I really do appreciate, is that um, we have to break the ideological hold of the, of the capitalist mythology. We have to confront it everywhere. We have, to, we have to confront it, we have to break it, we have to challenge it, we have to subvert. Uh, and so unjamming the insurrectionary imagination is about getting people to think about possibility and desirability, about getting us to think in more open and creative ways about what is um, and what could be. You know, it's about a points of entry. It's about points of entry for a radical critique of the existing reality. We do need to find those. We need as many points of entry as we can find to introducing a radical critique of the existing society. Now, um, De Bord is just one of the thinkers who insisted on the importance of ideology materialized, that the two things are really sort of a composite. But um, in my more recent research, I'm uh, going back to Simone Weil and thinking about things like the practicality of utopianism, right? The practicality of utopianism, it seems like a contradiction in terms, which is to say that uh, if it is utopian, it is precisely to, impractical. To say that, to call somebody a utopian is to say that they are impractical. And I really think we have to flip the script on that. It's really the practical people of politics who are the real utopians in that sense. Anyone who is a liberal who believes that um, we can get what we need through a capitalist election is either a utopian or an idiot, right? Anyone who believes that we can, um, we can get things, we can extract what we need from the existing system um, through elections and policy reforms is, 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 is a very, um, how do you say, uh, it's, it's a very sort of, uh, uh, inadequate utopianism. So what I say is, well, if we're going to be utopians, why not go for it? You know, why should we? Why should we be so utopian as to think that uh, we can get what we need from a capitalist election? If we're going to enter the space of utopianism, let's really think about possibility. Let's think about desire and possibility. Let's think about uh, what's wrong in the uh, material conditions of the world and let's think about how to break the ideological uh, hold that the capitalist mythology has um, and, the, and the, that really revolt is one of many things that tries to break up you know revolt is one of many things that tries to break up and 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 one last thing on this point about um, revolt connecting it back with revolt and divorce um, in uh, 1965, Guy Debord wrote an essay um, on the on uh, on uh, the uh, the Watts Los Angeles riot, and this was a part of what it meant to be a situationist for Debord was that here is a country, the United States, that 1964 and 1965 are the years of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. That they're, the, they're, the, they're the, the two years of these and the, to beam out into the world, to beam out into the world that the United States is uh, dealing with the race problem, right? We have the Voting Rights Act, we have the Civil Rights Act, but then somewhere a little bit hidden from the headlines, um, impoverished black people in Watts, Los Angeles, make a revolt. Yes, they did. They made a revolt. And the police came in with batons. It was a hot summer day, and they were taking refuge in the air-conditioned lobby of a movie theater. But they weren't paying customers. And what emerged was a race riot. And there's De Bourne, De Bourne in Paris. And he's watching, and he thinks, aha, 
look at that, a race riot in the country that claims to have solved the race problem. A race riot. So the revolt breaks the ideology, you see, is that the Watts riot of 1965 is a direct confrontation with um, any of the self-congratulatory claims of American liberals in that year. It says no. There are race riots in this country, and anyone who would talk about a post-racial America after Barack Obama's administration has to contend with the George Floyd rebellion. The revolt breaks the ideology. And so these things are not disconnected to be placed in some compartments. Which side is the idea? Which side is the world? No, the world is full of ideas, and we need to enter the fray. Considering our current moment, is it more utopian to suggest that the world has entered a permanent unequal dispensation or ultimately, as we need to, as you d described so perfectly, as we need to come to terms with, that the world was made and thus it can be changed? Um, I, I, think that's a really, I, th I think that's a really intensely powerful idea that people could get some use of. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, let me say on the thing about change, Kyle, from uh, 2016 in the present, or even from earlier in my uh, own work to the present time, you know, I can remember um, going into a university classroom and uh, teaching Marx and and uh, Marxism and other and anarchism and others and uh, critical theory and people saying, oh, but, uh, but, but, but people will never rise up. You know, I can remember uh, teaching Marx um, in 1999 or 2000 at the New School and students saying, oh, this is all I I interesting, but uh, people, people just accept. People just roll over. People just accept, you know. And just take a look. Um, they, they would say in the early 2000s, we just had an election where the president, the one who became president had far fewer votes than the one who lost. The one who won, you know, because of the electoral college, I'm talking now about uh, Bush and Gore. I mean, it's not the only time it's happened. And Americans, you know, would just say, well, let's be respectful. Uh, so what if the one who was voted, got the most votes won? Let's, uh, we know how it works. We go with, the, we go with the, one, the, one, the one who has fewer votes <laughs> takes the reins of power. And nobody, without mutiny or murmur, in, this, in the United States, without mutiny or murmur, without mutiny or murmur, it's just let it go. And so people would say to me, there's nothing, n we'll accept anything. People will accept everything without mutiny or murmur, without mutiny or murmur. People don't say that anymore, you know. So we don't know if anything will come from this revolt or that revolt. We don't know if they have any viable connection to real revolutionary politics, uh, even if we might hope that they do. But one thing has changed is nobody finds it hard anymore to believe that people will revolt. People will rise up. We don't know what will come of it, but we know it will happen. It's going to happen. It's going to keep on happening. And it won't ever stop until the material conditions of the world, such as they are, are completely abolished. Because the world that we, it's like what was the point about Spartacus, we can have no doubt that the system of slavery gives rise to the slave revolt. I think that actually leads on uh, quite well to uh, the next question that I had prepared. Um, uh, but before that, hearing you talk about utopia i i uh, couldn't help but thinking about a fantastic short essay i think it's only three or four pages by felix Guattari called utopia today um and of course his main concern in that essay as it often is with Guattari, uh is with impending environmental collapse and there he makes i think he ends the essay with this stunning declaration the true utopians today are the ones who think this can continue um yes that's exactly uh, but the, <laughs> right the question I wanted to ask uh, also concerns kind of the status of revolts in in this book and in some of the people that you engage with over the course of it. 
Uh, I'm particularly interested in how you think together desire and insurrection here, and also how in, in some, I think, mainly other attempts to think these together, a third term, which would otherwise be intrinsically connected to both of these, uh, ends up being excluded, and that being you know, revolution. Um, a couple of years back, I also read Chris Henry's uh, The Ethics of Political Resistance. I, I wrote a review for it, which is up on the Marx and Philosophy Review of Books. Uh, but he concludes that book more or less saying that political resistance supervenes on people's desires. A part of this is just, you know, good sense. It's extremely hard to get people to do things that they don't want to do. So <laughs> desire, in some sense, obviously needs to be, res uh, sorry, resistance in some sense obviously needs to be responsive to desire. Uh, but something I worry about uh, is that desire maybe doesn't take us far enough. Um, similarly for maybe communization theory, one of the criticisms you always see being made of it is that it focuses too much on the process of resisting capitalism and loses the end or purpose of anti-capitalist resistance. That is the abolition of capitalism. I, I should say, I don't think that your theory in this book succumbs to the issue in the same way that Chris Henry's does. Uh, here's a passage, which I really liked where you go and, um, where you go into some detail on this topic, you say, uh, to make and sustain a critique of capital today, that critique will have to be artistic, visual, sonic, funny, sexy, disruptive, pervasive, and expressed in a million different ways. This is the task of insurrection. The critique of capital is far better when it comes from a collectivity of everyday people in public, joyful, riveting, provocative, and often dangerous, illegal interruptions of everyday life. I guess I want to ask if, if we could hear more about how desire and insurrection combine to combat systems of oppression in a way that uh, is actually effective, that is that, that doesn't lose this end goal in the process, especially when desire can be manipulated, misdirected, or simply lack the requisite strength on its own to rise to the demands of class conflict and the overthrow of capitalism. Yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, in some ways, your question, Kenny, is, is, the, is the big question. I mean, what, what will come out of our revolts? What will come out of our expressions of disaffection? What will ultimately, what can, uh, it's almost like um, what Terry says in um, the proliferation of the margins, you know, will these little micro revolutions ever become really revolutionary? And it's very difficult to know what can or will come out of it. Um, let me uh, try to touch on some of what you've said. Um, desire is very problematic for the reasons you mentioned. Um, desire uh, is, uh, is, um, is held captive by capital. It has been seized upon. Uh, desire has been almost algorithmically by this point, when you want to talk about uh, specific developments um, in relation to human desire, uh, one today has to think about the algorithmic appropriation of human attention, right? Through uh, all of the different uh, technological uh, uh, devices that we have integrated our daily lives into, you know. So, I mean, people have written about this very well. Uh, Jonathan Crary in 24-7 and um, you, uh, Franco Berardi has written quite a bit about um, this, uh, sort of the ontological impact of what, what I would think of as cellular ontology almost, is that being in the world is completely integrated into uh, markets and capital is right there. So we can't simply say, we can't simply begin with desires because human desires are held hostage by capital. Our attentions are uh, seized upon with algorithmic confidence to the point that um, uh, companies are able to literally um, pay for how much of your attention they want. And it can be sold as a unit. 
um, so the commodification of human attention and desire has reached um, the level of a kind of confident science, I would say. Um, and you can learn about it in any university, including the one in which I sit, if you just go and take classes on marketing and advertisement. I mean, there's a whole building here where students learn about these algorithms and about the scientific confidence involved. And there's a history there. You have people like Ivy Lee, who invented public relations, and Edward Bernays. And it's been studied well by, you know, people like Habermas and, mm -hmm. and others. So we know about this. We can't simply start with desire. However, I am partial to the idea that, uh, which you can find in... Um, figures who are very important in my own research, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, Kenny, Julia Kristeva, and others. Um, I'm partial to the idea that uh, des desires can be manipulated, seized upon, human attentions can be algorith algorithmically held captive by capital, but not everything can be repressed forever. That which is kept down sometimes comes up. And it's it's, I am not um, partial to, as much as I like the work of someone like Jacques Camant, I am not partial to the idea that, uh, that the whole range of human desires is essentially supplanted or obliterated by capitalist appropriations. I think that people still have a happy thing called a midlife crisis. <laughs> I think that people still have these epiphanies where they say, what the hell am I doing with my life? This isn't making me happy. I think that the reason why uh, Seymour Drescher got on a plane to study May, June 68, and the reason why it was so interesting to so many people around the world is that it was an expression of disaffection and desire that was, was saying something like this. What it seems that we desire, there is a disaffection underneath, you know. It's not obliterated, it is there. And like the situation is said in those days, our ideas are in everyone's heads. One day they'll come out. So I think what we have to do is um, think about um, desire uh, critically. We, we can't just accept it at face value. Uh, we have to think about it critically. And sometimes it's not really the job of a philosopher or a writer or people talking about politics um, on the internet. It, it, the questions are posed about what is desirable and possible through the real movements themselves. Mm -hmm. So the real movements themselves, they materialize, you know, the materialization of rebellion. What's going on as we sit and speak to one another um, today? In, in France, and the rebellion against Macron is one of the most important things happening in our time. And originally, people said, oh, why do all these people in France rise up against the liberal Macron? He only wants two years. He only wants two years to delay the retirement age and only two years to get your pension. But it soon came out that... What's happening now in the revolts in France are not simply about retirement ages and pensions. They're expressions of disaffection about racism. They're expressions of disaffection about capitalism. They're there, there's a diverse expression of disaffection that is the very engine of the revolt. So it doesn't have to come out of the philosopher's head to get us to think about what, in a critical way, about what we really desire. And what are the real desires of real people in the real world? It doesn't begin. And one of my arguments in Spectres of Revolt is that revolt does philosophy better than the philosopher does. You know, the philosopher thinks and writes, okay, but the rebellion raises the questions about the injustice of the existing reality far more powerfully. You know, if you're in France today, um, you are in the middle regardless of your politics and positions on the wave of revolts now happening. You are in the middle of a visceral and vital debate about life. And it isn't because of a French philosopher. It's because of the revolts, you see. So the philosophers, we can, we can take it up and we can talk to one another about it, but we cannot uh, 
pretend that the the, the, the critical question of what is human desire um, is just some philosophical inquiry. No, no, it comes out in the world through the materialization of real revolts. You know, and so I think desire is very important because if we if we give it up, if we if we treat it as it's entirely taken over, and there's a kind of totalitarian control of human desire, well, then we may as well just give up feeling, thinking, wanting, you know, trying. But um, but I am partial to the idea that all that is done, all the damage and abuse that is done to our attention, to our desires as human beings, there is still something underneath. I don't call it some authentic uh, ontological state. I don't make an essentialist argument. But I also do not think that human beings' uh, values can be adequately, uh, values, desires, hopes, and dreams can be adequately gratified in and by capital. Capitalist society is ultimately destructive. Um, it is it, it is, it, it is uh, uh, really at a terminal state when you think about the ecological situation. And it's like I think Kyle said, you know, that the true utopians are the one who thinks, ones who think this can go on. Uh, it cannot go on. Um, so if there's nothing more to us than the desire that capital has taken hostage, then we are doomed. Um, and we may be. We may be doomed, but um, I think that whether it's delusional or, or not, and one hopes that it isn't, uh, we have to go on as if emancipations are possible. And we have to count ourselves among those in a long history who've committed themselves to emancipatory projects of one kind or another. I mean, the best way, it seems to me, to uh, decide the question in favor of doom is to um, is is to accept the conclusion that it's done. Um, you know, it's pretty dire, and I vacillate between hope and despair, and sometimes I hang out more on the despair side of things myself. Um, but then things give me hope, and some of the things that give me hope are like what's happening right now in France, and Macron cannot put a cap on it; he cannot stop it, and if he does stop it. Um, it's the specter of revolt will continue to haunt that society. What is happening now in France is a resumption, not a repetition. It is a resumption of what happened in May, June 68. It is a resumption, and that is a resumption in some various ways of unfinished business from the Paris Commune and so on and so forth. I mean, slave revolts and everything else that I'm addressing in specters of revolt is uh, what, what I think what's happening is it will not go away. You know, it will not go away. It's going to maybe settle down. But anyone who thinks it's over and done should look around because the society that we inhabit has got to change. It cannot go on. Only the worst utopians, only the least imaginative of the utopians think that it can go on this way forever. It cannot. Those are the least imaginative utopians. Right? And so I think... You know, desire is a part of this. And, and why shouldn't we think about it? There is a chapter in Spectres of Revolt called Beyond the Old Virtue of Struggle. Um, and one of the things that I was thinking of when I wrote that chapter, Beyond the Old Virtue of Struggle, is um, almost as the Surrealists, they talk about miserableism. You know, the surrealists, uh, not just uh, like uh, Andre Breton and some of those who were hanging around with the situationists, but like my, my friend Ron Sikorsky in, in uh, The Anarchist Surrealist, um, miserableism. You know, a lot of the long pol global political histories of uh, revolutionary politics center on struggle. And... And what I was saying in that, that, that quote that you cited, uh, Kenny, about the artistic, visual, sonic, funny, sexy, pervasive, you know, I think we have to, we have to find um, the activities of revolt. Um, we have to find joy in them. We have to find ways um, of uh, 
of, of finding uh, contestatory and critical activities joyful, you know, because if we don't find joy in in a wide and diverse range of uprisings against the existing conditions, then they, that will stop. Right? We we are are. There is there is no there are no there's no shortage of people who are trying to parlay our desires into other places, so it should be joyful, you know. And there is that book um, that AK Press published an edited collection several years ago called Joyful Militancy, and I like this idea. Um, you know, struggle is going to happen. People who are impoverished and exploited, people who are miserable, living precarious lives, and which is to say they have no certain futures, cannot expect joy there. We cannot expect joy there. But we also cannot deny the fact that when people gather in Paris against Macron, they are happy to do it. We cannot deny the fact that um, when people gathered in Tahrir Square in Cairo and in 18 days ended a regime that had lasted nearly 30 years, that they did not feel joy in doing it, you know, and they did. They spoke of it as an ecstasy, and I like that because um, it's a, it's a way of pulling our desire back from the, the from the colonizers, the same old colonizers, except that they've gone from geography to attention and emotion and psychology. They've stuck to geography too, no doubt. Um, we live in a you know colonial racist society. Our societies are societies of colonial racism. And I think this is, isn't too hard to see. But the colonizers have moved, they've added, shall we say, to the colonization of geographies, um, the colonizations of psychologies and attentions. And so a part of the focus on desire is to say, we won't let you have it. We take it back. Um, we take back what we can. You covered, you went, my last, the last question I had was inspired by Kenny's previous question and thus we got there, obviously. So I will just say <laughs> that like you killed it. Uh, but I was inspired by this idea of things from below in general, but you remark on the book about philosophy from below in this case, um, the sort of the, demonstra the demonstration outside of the traditional confines by which we restrict a lot of the production of this type of knowledge and its proliferation and its prioritization in our society. It can be so fundamentally hierarchical. Um, uh, years, uh, years back now, I was in a writing workshop with a friend of mine in a men's prison, and we were talking about, um, as a group, what gives particular, what gives rise to particular work. This very, like this thing that you struggle with in academia too, between the production of my own ideas and the solidification of other people's ideas and, you know, what's mine and what's not and like really interesting stuff. We were just trying to find inspiration for short fiction, but I think these feelings are really familiar and we suggested this idea of creativity as a way of exploring how one's, how one feels this, a, a really good way of, you know, getting people into writing. Um, but as how possibly your feelings and experience could give rise to feelings and experiences in other people. How does how I feel and what I experience connect with someone else? And I just remember my buddy who ended up with this story about a talking plant in a jail cell that refused to stop growing out of the toilet and out of the walls and um, out of inside of the bedding and cracking and collapsing the small comforts of prison because spring is here. Hmm. Um, and it's just like this really impactful from below experience that has me constantly thinking about forever spring as this constantly constant challenge to the persistence of things like incarceration, mm. even when we have modulating limits of control societies, um, as I think uh, we've, you know, so, you know, usefully pointed to um, and how there's still hope even despite all of that because spring rises from the darkest places despite you know possibility and uh, despite our own limitations in our imagination um and revolt is like the, i'm i'm constantly inspired by the Im we we'll use images but constantly inspired by the image of students um breaking open uh stones to 
used to be able to throw the police to break the breaking of the street for projectiles yeah the fount of the <laughs> yeah like, like yeah. i mean exactly like in the in the construction of the barrier out of the the like seemingly most persistent aspects of our contemporary society the structures and the physical structures that represent them um emerges this fount of the new this wellspring yes yes, yes. and it's what it's wildly inspiring yes. i can't it's just stayed with me for as long as i've known it and you know yeah well it's beautiful what you said i find it to be beautiful um the stories and i think the fiction is it's it's uh fiction is important music is important um you know i, I think it's really important for us to participate in a kind of decolonization of desire you know amongst other decolonizations decolonization of theory decolonization of geography why should one choose <laughs> I mean, it seems to me quite obvious that we should we should support the decolonization of everything and um and i love what you said and i mean um, you know, Ke Kenny refers to the, the famous saying, you know, um, beneath the paving stones, the beach. Um, and there was also the saying, the retour à la normal. We mean, go well, we go back to, when will we go back to the normal everyday life? Um, one of the things that I would just add to what you said, Kyle, which was so beautiful, really, is that um, I think we have to try to find beauty in unlikely places. You know, like it, we have to flip the script, as it were. So, part of uh, part of Spectres of Revolt, which uh, Spectres of Revolt was um, one of the bases of the of a, of a book called a Riotous Epistemology, and you've mentioned Kyle a number of times, epistemology, and you know the riot, the revolt are often caric caricatured as irrational violence irrational senseless violence and whereas i think that they are the teachers they are the professors they are the philosophers philosophy from below is to say i see the reason the rationality of the revolt and not only can i see it but i can learn from it i can become its student and not to sort of tell the revolt what to do as some social scientists um you know are wants to do they want to tell the revolt how to win and I think this is this is the wrong approach. We have to see beauty in that, and we have to see the stories that come out of it. You know, there are stories, and there's art that comes out of it, right? And um, and 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 the weeds that grow out from the ground. I mean, that sort of rhizomatic image of the of the of the um, subterranean growth that comes out. I mean, there's beauty in that. Um, and so, so I think you know. Um, it's 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 also a question of knowledge. It's not just an ontological question of who we are uh, being in the world. It's also a question of epistemology. It's a question of of who knows, uh, who knows what. And you know, I can remember going after uh, when Spectres of Revolt was to be published. I was going to Baltimore um, shortly after the Baltimore uprising of 2015. Uh, uh, Spectres of Revolt was in at Repeater Books, but it wasn't it wasn't out yet. And I was going to Red Emma's, which is a radical um, bookstore in uh, Baltimore. And I can remember conversations with the people at the at the anarchist bookstore, and they said, "Oh, uh, uh, Dr. Gilman Opowski, but you're a professor. You can't come here and tell us um, how to think about the revolt in Baltimore." Uh, we just we, we have people here who will be very um, offended by that because they were participants in the uprising and it, it affected our lives directly. And um, the way that I could visit and speak to uh, participants in the uprising was just telling them the truth, which for me was, I have nothing to teach them. I just want to learn, you know, and good theory happens following real movements from below. Right. It's the it's the it's the it's the, insur it's the insurrection. It's the uprising that is the is the vanguard um, for thinking. Theory doesn't lead it. It follows rather. And, you know, um, and and that was something that I really appreciated in like Raya Duniavskaya's 
Marxism is she always said when she was writing in this in this 1970s and 80s about um, women's struggles and black struggles, black uprisings in the United States, Dudievskaya always said, there is the new thinking. It's exactly what you said, Kyle. The new idea, the new thinking, the epiphanies come from there. You know, that's where they come from. And I think there's something not just sort of irrefutable about that, but I also think there's something beautiful about that. Is you know, it, it's 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 not those who claim to be the masters of thought who have the best ideas. It's those who are caricatured as thoughtless and irrational who are really at the forefront of new thinking. Yes, that's what I. That's what is really, in some ways, the pr the, the premise of Spectres of Revolt. And you can see it in the subtitle, you know, the, the intellect of insurrection, the philosophy from below. Well, I think we should maybe get on to the last question about now. Uh, and it's a bit broader in scope. Um, uh, you've spoken a little bit already about how Spectres of Revolt relates to other things that you've worked on, uh, even as, you know, kind of its direct relation to your other book, Right as Epistemology. Um, uh, so Spectres of Revolt was published back in 2016, uh, seven years ago now. Um, by then, you had already published three books, uh, Unbounded Politics, Spectacular Capitalism, and Precarious Communism. All great titles, by the way. And since 2016, you've had two further books published and one more coming out soon. Uh, right as Epistemology and the Communism of Love being the ones that are already out. I'd, I'd really like to hear how all of these works relate to each other in your mind uh, and kind of what place Spectres of Revolt plays in this overall trajectory of your work. I mean, some themes have naturally been continuous across your various books, like uh, the Zapatistas, for instance, have appeared in a bunch of your works and also the Situationists. So what is it that you get from these uh, uh, continuous components of your work and what's, sh what's shifted and changed in your understanding of these things from 2011 to 2016, and then, I guess, 2016 to now? <laughs> yeah. No, I really appreciate that question. Um, it, it's, um, it, I think it's, uh, for me, it's an important question because um, I suppose it gets to the heart of what uh, seems to me the most pressing issues. I mean... One tends to study things that and write about things that they think are important. <laughs> so, so if you put it all together, it's kind of, you know, it, it forces you to focus on that. I would say that the, uh, the, the theme from the very beginning was uh, power in other places. Um, it was about looking for power in other places than the ruling class or power from below or power or power or politics by other means than their conventional forms. Um, trying to think against the powers of the ruling class or the ruling classes at various in various places and times. So uh, Unbounded Publics was in, in many ways directly connected to what I was just saying because for that book, I was looking at um, uh, the history of public sphere theories, you know, theories about what is the public sphere, Hannah Arendt, Immanuel Kant, C. Wright Mills, Jürgen Habermas. And then I was looking at a real rebellion and that was the uprising of the Zapatistas in Mexico in 1994. And what it, what struck me as so interesting, um, and th that was my first major research project, what struck me as so interesting was that the best ideas about how to think about the public were not in the pages of Kant, Arendt, Mills, Habermas, but they were coming out of the mountains of Chiapas. You know, indigenous Mayan Indians who were involved in high stakes political theory, the political theater, not political theory, the political theory too. <laughs> but what I meant to say was political theater. They didn't have enough rifles. So they carved 
um, what looked like rifles and painted them out of wood so that they could have a bigger show of force than they really had. They didn't have a an air force, so they threw paper airplanes from the balconies of hotels. There was an artistic, and they captured the imagination of people of Mexico, and they couldn't. They resisted the vil efforts to vilify them, uh, state efforts of vilification, but they also were the advance in theory that um, that I couldn't find being written by philosophers, you know, is that they they were putting things together. How to think about the possibility of a revolution against capitalism and their, their, the Zapatistas' uh, big sort of um, declaration was uh, uh, for humanity against neoliberalism, right? And they were responding to NAFTA uh, and the uprising was on the inauguration day of the signing of NAFTA, January 1st, 1994. And Subcomandante Marcos, you know, the sort of uh, uh, happenstance leader, he had a theory that philosophers like Enrique Dussel learned from. So Enrique Dussel was a philosopher who said, I'm going to learn how to think from the example of Marcos. And Marcos, they said to him, are you the leader? And he said, oh, I am, I am the one who follows. Marcos would say, I am the one who follows. And they would say, who is the leader, you know? And everybody in the mountains would say, uh, you know, uh, todos somos Marcos. We are all Marcos. And they had the balaclavas and everything. And there was something beautiful and artistic and theatrical, but also theoretically important, right? It was about um, the leader who follows. It was a different way of thinking about leadership, and it was a different way of thinking about uprising. And it was a digging up of the tombstone, the Cold War tombstone that Derrida was talking about when he wrote Spectres of Marx. They said at the same time as that book was published, the Zapatista said at the same time as Derrida's book was published, there will be no tombstone on revolt. And so in that book, I, I began first thinking about philosophy from below, from the mountains of Chiapas. Then you know, after that, with spectacular capitalism, it was a similar sensibility, right? It was, why don't philosophers read Debord? Maybe he doesn't have a PhD. Um, you know, but what about the uprisings that he was thinking about, that he was, that his, his, his theory was connected to in various ways? And, and all of the work after that, precarious communism, riotous epistemology, specters of revolt, um, it's, it's really all communism of love. It's really all of it is about um, looking for what we can do um, uh, and, looking for what, and looking for power in other places. So the communism of love is really a book about, it's a really ontological study. It's about forms of life that are non-capitalist or uh, is it possible for us to um, to actualize forms anti-capitalist forms of life in the present, you know, is it possible that the best things in our capitalist society are in fact the least capitalist things? You know, and so that's what got me thinking about the communism of love. But I'm always looking for real, concrete, and material uh, examples of thinking against the established uh, powers and concepts of the ruling class. And it began there with the Zapatistas. One of the things that's changed, I mentioned before, uh, one of the things that's changed is that um, people have, have, have an easier time imagining revolts because, because there are so many that we think of and talk about. Uh, and, and there hasn't been a lot of space and time in between them. I would say in the last uh, 15 years, there has been a kind of um, uh, a diversity of global uprisings that has made it difficult for people to claim they don't happen, which it might be hard to believe this, but people did claim that for a long time. And in some ways, the Zapatistas were a reopening. They were saying, no, we're not done. Um, but it, 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 you know, and people talked about things like the Battle of Seattle and in uh, and, and anti-globalization, but there have been long passages of relative quiet. And um, so one thing that's great, I would say, that's, that's positive is that um, 
I would say that people are thinking about revolts. Um, and we are trying to think about what they mean. And we're trying to think about uh, what's happening and what the revolts signify and what may come from them. One of the things that's not very good, <laughs> there are many actually we could add, but we're running out of time. So I'll, I'll just say that one of the things that's not very good is that um, our enemies um, have seized upon the revolt. Uh, that was ours. Give it back. Uh, you know, the revolt <laughs> is not is not for uh, right wing um, uh, conservative uh, pseudo libertarian reactionaries who want to defend white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Uh, the revolt is not theirs. Hands off. But uh, I found a strange thing happening um, in the United States, but not only in the United States, um, because I was I was lecturing in in China um, in 2018, and, and it came there. It came up there too. Um, but it's something like when you say insurrection now, people think sometimes about reactionary uh, right wing efforts to restore the powers of, um, of, of a vile, you know, um, capitalist cretin like Donald Trump. That's not insurrection. That's a paramilitary deployment of state power. That's not insurrection. That's a paramilitary deployment of state power to defend the status quo. And if at all possible, to put us in a time machine to go back to the glory days of white nationalist, white supremacy. And it's, it's now we have to contend with that, I will say, that those of us on the left, broadly speaking, or the left, um, you know, Marxists, anarchists, communists, revolutionaries, activists, philosophers, intellectuals, whatever, artists, critical people, now we have to try to take back the idea of the insurrection. It isn't January 6th. No, that is not an insurrection. That is a reactionary tantrum of paramilitary power of the state. We have to take it back. And, and, and before, uh, not too long ago, to say insurrection and to say revolt, people thought about uh, revolutionaries. <laughs> they thought about our people. Uh, and now, now that has changed. So we have to we have to go back to it. But I would just, uh, one last thing, uh, unless you have anything else. Um, Kenny asked a very important question that I, I failed to address. Um, and uh, and I, I know there were others that I, I failed to address, and I apologize for that. But the thing about class conflict and the revolt uh, culminating in a real confrontation with class power um, you know, I want to see that happen, and um, I'm not alone. But if we're very honest, it is not up to us uh, individually as people who think about uh, the world. We have to see what comes of it. And I wish I could give a more satisfying answer and say that this will happen or that will happen, but we are past the time of uh, Marxists who should be in the business of predicting anything. Um, so, 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 so I have to leave it open. Wow. Well, thank you so much again for joining us, Richard. That was a real tour de force. Uh, really, thank you. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me and thank you for doing such good work with your show. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.